64, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
as we unite in our historic confession of the Christian Church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <laughs> Let us prepare our hearts for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we turn our hearts to you this morning, we're both thankful and troubled. So thankful for you, our loving God, for Jesus, your only begotten Son, and for the Holy Spirit which, who guides and directs. We're thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ within these walls and beyond. We're thankful for our families by birth or marriage or by heart. We're thankful for this St. Paul Church family we're thankful for this day. It is one that you have made, and we are called to rejoice and be glad in it. Yet, our eyes and hearts cannot lose sight of the multiple images of devastation in Texas and Louisiana and across the globe. There are people hurting, grieving loss of so much and so many, and with faces that haunt us as they look for signs of hope. We feel helpless. And yet we know you, God, are God. You are big enough, strong enough, and loving enough for each and every one. You've got this. But you need us to be your hands and hearts here. Please, Lord, show us how we can serve you by sharing your love, your hope, and your grace today and every day. We also give thanks for this gift and privilege of prayer. It was we join together in the prayer you taught your disciples so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we also forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us worship God with his tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Receive, receive these, O God, your tithes and our offerings, and allow them to be multiplied within this church so that we may be able to further your kingdom and hasten your return. Amen.
please remain standing for the reading of today's scripture. It comes from Psalm 46, verses 8 through 11. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The word of God for the people of God. God. The peace of Christ be with you. We welcome you again to St. Paul and ask that you register on those red pew pads which are on the center aisle. As the children come forth for the children's sermon, please greet each other in Christ's love. question for you. Have you ever been called by the wrong name? Yes. Yes. Yes, you have. Who's called you by the wrong name? Anybody? (laughs) Why? Has your teacher ever called you by the wrong name? Uh Uh-huh. Has your your mom or, sorry, has your mom or dad ever called you by the wrong name? Let me, yes, I got an affirm. Have you ever called your mom and dad by the wrong name? No. Did you ever call your mom, dad, dad, mom? No. no, yes. Okay, here's an honest one here. When I was growing up, you know, my, I had three older brothers and my mom, when she was getting angry, she would start at the top when she was looking at me, David, Mark, Jeff, and then she would go through the list of dogs, Shep, Buttons, and oh, John, and finally get to me. It was hilarious. And you know what I did once? I laughed at her. I only did that once. (laughs) Never did it again. But I thought maybe I would wear a name tag today. And uh, I bought this from a friend of mine. And uh, Waffle House. And it has somebody's name on here. Is that my name? No. Well, what if somebody comes up and says, Hi, Kara. (laughs) Wouldn't that be weird? Yeah. Yeah. And I just wanted to, I just, I, I only use this as, a, as, as an example because many times there, there are moments where we sometimes think and uh, are called by the wrong name. But no matter how we label ourselves or no matter what you call yourself, you know what God says about you? That you are His. Isn't that neat? Isn't that wonderful? That's right. And it, it is pretty sad though, if I'm thinking about my mama and not remembering my name, I might think I'm not important to her, you know? But the fact is, is God always knows our name and my mama eventually ever gets there. So, well listen, let me have a prayer with you and I'll let you all go to Children's Church. Does that sound like fun? Yay, okay. Y'all look this way and let's have a prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who are in our midst that remind us, O God, of your goodness and your love. And we pray, O God, that you would continue to whisper into these little ears and ours who we are and whose we are. Thank you. Amen.
I uh, actually bought this from somebody, and it wasn't Kara. Um, I actually saw somebody who had it, and I really wanted it. A friend of mine and I call Waffle House our bistro. And uh, so, um, anyways, would you join me, please, in prayer? May the words of my mouth, O God, and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. We pray, O God, that your Holy Spirit would come and, and take ordinary things, ordinary words, and make them gospel to us. That in some mysterious way to us, yet very common thing that you do through your Holy Spirit, we pray that you would empower us and encourage us to live as men and women and boys and girls who are defined by you. What is from you may it stick to our hearts and what is not from you may it fall to the ground and shatter. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I've shared with you this, I, I have shared with you this in the past, but it, it bears saying once again, because I'm so happy for my mom and my dad who were blessed with four boys. <laughs> and there were some moments growing up that, that uh, I am certain now looking back, mom did not think it was a blessing. You see, there were two things that, uh, that seemed to concern um, us as her boys and my mom. And they centered around um, Sunday mornings. You see, what concerned my mom on Sunday mornings was that we walked out the door with socks that matched and shoes that matched and our clip-on tie that we could never find. You see, we were ready to go with a boot on one foot and a sandal on the other. And we didn't care if we had a t-shirt on or half of our tucked in shirt, button up shirt was in or out or we didn't matter. It didn't bother us, but it sure did bother mom. And she got a little anxious. She got a little worried and, and it didn't help that dad was out in the VW bus. We had two of those, those VW buses honking the horn. And so we would finally make our way out the door still putting on our jacket, fidgeting to put on our, our shoes. And, and that's what concerned mom as much as getting to church. The second uh, thing that, that kind of concerned us boys was where we were going to sit in the van because that van never got warm in the, in the dense winters. We had, there, there was this pipe that came out of the floor in, behind my dad's seat, and it would come out, and there would be a little vent there, and all four of us would want to sit right there, even though we knew that it would take an hour for that vehicle to start pushing out heat, and it only took us 10 minutes to get to church. But we fought over that. And what we fought over made my mom anxious again, and she would do this, she would do this, she would do this, she would get out of her seat and she would come back there. I mean, there were, I mean, she, don't make me come back. And she did come back there over and over again. And then we got to church and you want me to say that when we walked into that church, we were all happy and put smiles on. No, mom was still tugging at us. And we went to Sunday school and we went to church and we sat down and, and I would fidget around with the bulletin and, and all the cards that were in the pew in front of me, I would take out and do tic-tac-toe and the line game and stuff like that. And, and, and soon I got so absorbed into that game that I was, I was unaware of what was really happening in my midst and I started to fidget, move, talk louder and louder. My mom would give me this look this look. She would nudge me, and then she would do this. She'd fold her arms like this, so nobody could see. And she'd lean over to where she could get the fat of my arm, and she would pinch me. <laughs> now, for a kid who did not know where he was at that moment, he was unbeknownst, I would say, what are you doing? And everybody would look. But it kind of settled around the idea of stop. 
be still. Stop making a scene. Would you calm down? Now today, mom uh, has visited just recently with us, and, and mom, I think, is chuckling under her breath as she watches Lisa and I. We go from here to there, and we go from there to the, the other place, and we're moving, we're driven, and we're looking at John. Why don't you just do what is right? Why don't you just kind of obey and respect? And we look at Anna, stop being so dramatic, and we look at Katie. What do you say to a three-and-a-half-year-old? I mean, we just keep on going and going. And last night, this is not the only time, Katie comes in about 3 a.m., slams the door in our bedroom, climbs up into our bed, and I was so asleep, I did not hear that. You know what? woke me up, she turns sideways and she starts kicking me, just like this, all night long. And so I get her up and I move her to the side. And then finally I get up and say, Katie, be still. And I know my mom is chuckling and laughing because she now has this non-anxious presence. I've been thinking about what it means to be still. I've been thinking about what it means to live into this, this, this realm where there, the actions and the movements and, the, and the, the things that seem to push us and control us kind of fall and melt around us. I was thinking that because this is what this passage seems to, to point to. The passage starts in verse 8 with the psalmist speaking to the congregation. And what the psalmist says to the congregation, it says, Come, look, behold the works of the Lord, which is a practice of the Israelites over and over and over again. This call, this invitation that each other would give, remember what God has done. Look at the things that, that God has continued to do. Look what God promises to do. Come. Look. Behold. And then in verse 10, it's ever so subtle, but the psalmist is no longer speaking to the congregation. God chimes in. And at the culmination of that passage, of this, this psalm, the Lord says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And as I read something of this, uh, read this over and over and over again over the last couple of weeks, and, and I memorized this at, at a very young age, this be still and know that I am God, my mind flashes back to those Sunday mornings when I was a kid. And my mind recently flashes back just about 12 hours ago to Katie. And I wonder if that's what God is doing. If he's getting agitated with us, if he's at wit's end and he's just like saying, stop, you're annoying me. Stop kicking me. And I'm convinced that that's just not the case because that's not what scripture supports. What we see here is an invitation of God to join him as he reveals himself to us. And what God is not necessarily just asking us to do is to just stop movement, our actions, to actually be literally motionless, but also I think there is in our minds things that control us. That the more we find ourselves getting pushed to the limit, the more we find ourselves that these things that occupy our time soon occupy our mind and we become so, so driven by these things that we get to a point where there is almost a culmination, a climax that if one more thing happens, I'm going to blow up and that all happens internally. I think that is what God is referring to also, not just to be motionless, but to cease 
to stop and get out of the traffic of your mind, the storms. I mean, isn't that true in many of our lives? That what is on our calendar actually controls our mind and our attention? I mean, what God meant to be still was just not an action, but to still your mind. Because what occupies our time seems to occupy our mind over and over and over again. Have you ever spoken to somebody and you could tell as you are talking with them that they're a million miles away? Yes? Do you recognize when somebody is really not with you because their mind is churning so many things? I mean, there's some of us here who, who worship and some who aren't here, who are regularly here, who worship, who study. And where they find themselves is even though they are present, they're not present. Their mind is somewhere else. They find themselves reading scripture or praying and they find that their mind is just churning. Their, their mind is active and, they, and they're... And they're Invited to just be still. To slow down enough to be present. You see, what is happening in these verses is, is that what the psalmist is saying and reiterating what God is speaking is that these two things, these two commands, be still and know, are not separate commands that can be done as a silo. It's, it, they are logically connected. One has, leads into the next. And let me give you an example. I could tell my son, wash your car and clean your room. And it doesn't really matter what order he does it in. He could wash his car first or clean his room. He could wash his room and clean his car. It don't matter. Yeah, I did that on purpose. It, it doesn't really matter. But if I tell him to wash his bed sheets and make his bed, I like to see him do that. You see, there are these, I think, what the psalmist is reiterating here that the God is, is sharing is that one leads to the other. See, God doesn't always, doesn't always explain. He never promises to give explanation. What he does is he promises to reveal himself. And there is a stipulation that sometimes we miss that if you really want to know what God is like, you got to be still. And not just physically. you got to let your mind focus and be present now at the place that you find yourself. You see, the Israelites needed to hear this because when anything went wrong in their life as a nation and even as individuals, they became religiously fidgety. They became anxious to do more, to find themselves sacrificing more, to find themselves being kind to more. And they probably formed committees to make more committees that would make rules and more rules because the more they did, they felt that they were, they were satisfying the commandments of God. And it's understandable that they could have feel, felt this way, but they forgot that what God said before the law was you are mine and I am yours in Exodus 21 where he says, I am the Lord, your God. I am yours. You are mine. Just take a moment to be present before you can come up with any rule or any activity and any act of service. I want you to just think about that. And I want you to just come and behold what I just did for you. And where you are right now is in a place where I will meet you and be your God. 
You know what's fascinating? That in Mark's gospel, there is this, there is this story that he unfolds, most certainly from the mouth of Peter, about the disciples with Jesus crossing over the Sea of Galilee. And, and I've never been there, but what I've heard is that storms can come up quick and you don't even know that they're coming. And as they're traveling across, there's this storm that comes up. And it takes them for a loop as it starts to tear apart the boat. And so they are all active, both physically and mentally, about what? survival. And what happens when somebody recognizes Jesus asleep on a pillow? They wake him up. They didn't recognize that before, but they wake him up now. And what is the very first thing they said to Jesus? Don't you care that we might perish? And Jesus said, be still. And the winds stopped. Now notice what Jesus didn't say. Why am I your last resort? Before he said, be still, while the winds are raging and the storms are, are brewing, why didn't he look at his disciples and say, now, why didn't you come to me for earlier? Why am I your last resort? Why, why are you just, why haven't you seen what I've been doing and recognize what I've been doing to, to invite me into this? Don't you recognize that even in the midst of your storm, I am here with you? He didn't say that. But notice what the disciples said. And we do this too, don't we? When storms come up, we try everything. We use every tool we cash in every favor. We try to go to every specialist, get all the advice we can, and we find out that what it does is it makes our heart more turbulent and our soul and our spirit more anxious and it occupies our mind and it starts to control us and we forget to be still. And even when we're in a place like this, we're never really present. We go to God, just like Jesus, the Jesus' disciples, and we say, don't you care about me? And we go and accuse him. When all we have to do is stop. Be still. Recognize that he doesn't need our help to be God. There were two little stories that I, were t I was taught when I was growing up, and one was centered around this picture on our dining room table. One of the things that this, this dining room table, uh, pi rather this, uh, this picture on the wall, it had Jesus standing in a garden with this door, a peculiar door, and him knocking. And, and, it's, and it's from Revelation 3.20. And, and the story that I was told was that, that this is Jesus knocking at the door of our heart, and there's no door handle on the outside, and, and that's because it can only be opened from the inside. And this is the passage that is, is, is it's in reference to. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with him and he with me. And I was also told another story about three little pigs and a big bad wolf that didn't wait at the door and knock, but he came and he said, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll come. And I wondered why the creator of the universe would stand and knock and this little wolf would blow in our door and force himself on us. And I can only imagine that it has something to do with this characteristic of Jesus saying, look, invite me in. I'm not promising everything will go your way. But what I am promising is that in the midst of the journey with me, you 
will be reminded of what's so much more important. That as you embrace those margins of your life that are so easily squeezed out and occupied by so many different things, that you will, you will see yourself, your anxiety, if you would just create these margins, these moments where you are still, both emotionally, mentally, and physically, and that you would be present, and that you would hear, and you would listen to the words that I might speak to you through Scripture, through other people, and you would know that I am God. Because these two commands can not be separated. You got to be still to know. You got to stop and be willing to listen and embrace those margins and be present where you are right now and who's with you. And allow the Savior to say to your storms, be still. But it takes a little bit on our part, doesn't it? Maybe we got to turn the TV off. Maybe we got to turn down the music. Maybe we just need to embrace and be comfortable with nothing to do. Maybe there is something inside of us that wants to squash out uh, this, this, this notion of being still, thinking that maybe if we don't do enough, we will miss out on something. But maybe in that process, when we try to squeeze everything we can get out of life, maybe what we're really doing is squeezing God out of our life. Give yourself permission to be still. Embrace the moment and be okay. Because I know that, that what I have experienced about God is that he is more willing to reveal himself to you than we are to be still. So hear that door knocking, someone knocking at the door, hear that voice. What would your week be like this week if you really said, okay, God, here's my calendar for the next five days. Here are my emotions. Here are my relationships that are, that are um, the people that I'm going to meet these next five days. Here is my past. I give it to you. Here's my future. Lord, I live in the present. Lord, I surrender. And to be still and to know that he is God. Just imagine. Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you continue to reveal your, your still, soft voice and give us the strength, O oh God, to stop and listen. And may your Holy Spirit continue to speak these words to us in the days to come. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. As we celebrate Holy Communion together, what I'd love for you to know and realize and remember that this is uh, something that is just not for the members of St. Paul. You don't have to be a member of our church to partake in Holy Communion. You can, you, can, you can take it with us. We have an open table. 
And, and the second thing that I want to remind you is, is as you come, there are two urns up here that, that once a month we collect funds for a benevolence fund or an altar fund. And Shane and I see firsthand how this money is used. And I want to tell you, I wish I could just share with you all, please continue to give generously to our benevolence fund and our altar fund. So please take your hymnals and turn to page 12. Hear this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up, we, lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right. And a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke that bread, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living offering in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim this mystery of our faith, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us who are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one, one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ broken for you. We do this in remembrance of him. This is his blood shed and for the forgiveness of sins. And receive this today as, 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 a, a, as, a, as the sacrifice and the new covenant of Christ given to us by God.
those men and women and boys and girls who are rejoicing in the wonderful gift of God. Amen.
hymn number 534. We'll sing the first and third verse. Please stand as you are able and join us in singing. Together, left together, round the door. 